Good afternoon. The rule of law as it pertains to the executive's role, seeing that the laws are faithfully executed and the participation of attorneys in that process are not self-executing. As a result, we've put into a place a variety of mechanisms to promote the profit, proper functioning of the rule of law. Indeed, included within those mechanisms are legislative oversight, the Inspector General program, the regulation of attorney conduct through state bars, departmental agencies, and courts. Today, we're going to examine how those programs function and to the extent that they lack the capacity to achieve their objectives and goals, what steps can be taken to improve them. My conversation with Jim Cole is designed to be not unlike a fireside chat. In fact, I spent all morning putting this fireside aside so that we could make it um, um, so exactly what we want it to be. Let me start by asking you as a former DAG, Jim, to quickly outline the roles of various units within the Department of Justice, which deal to a greater or lesser extent with the conduct of attorneys and what they do. So you might want to think about OPR, PREO, the Inspector General, public integrity, the effect of the McDade Amendment with respect to state bars, and the role of courts and congressional oversight. Well, thank you, Ron. You just went through my list. <laughs> Basically, those are primarily the areas. You've got a, a variety of institutions within the Department of Justice that help in the regulation of lawyers. All of them have their own role. All of them have their own parts to play. Some overlap, some don't overlap. One of the first ones to think about is PREO, which is the Professional Responsibility Advice Office. It's a place that lawyers can go to, and according to its charter, to get prompt advice. They're in the midst of a case, a thorny problem comes up, they don't know what to do under the rules of professional responsibility. They can go to PREO and they can get some advice very quickly and advice that they can rely upon. You also have within the department the Office of Professional Responsibility. Now, while they're not designed to give you immediate advice, they are designed to deal with complaints about the conduct of lawyers within the Department of Justice, whether or not they have violated the rules and department policies about how prosecutors should behave in the course of their work as prosecutors, uh, whether or not the prosecutors have followed the ethical rules that they're bound by, and we'll get into that in a second, and generally whether or not there should be at the end of an investigation, either a report, and many times the OPR office issues a report, and many times this report is public, whether there will be internal discipline for the lawyer, either uh, a, a docking in pay, a suspension, or even termination, and or whether there'll be a referral to the state bar, for the state bar to take disciplinary action against the lawyer. Now, there's also the Inspector General's Office, which is within the Department of Justice, and it's, it tries to work with OPR, but they have very separate roles. The Inspector General's Office at Justice won't deal with attorney discipline for violating rules of professional responsibility. They won't deal with issues relating to the attorney's work as an attorney, conducting an investigation, going to court, filing pleadings, things of that nature. But if a lawyer does something um, improper, if a lawyer sells drugs out of the Department of Justice, if the lawyer steals, uh, if the lawyer does something other than in the course of his or her war work as a prosecutor, the Inspector General's office can become involved. Now you also have the courts that can be involved. And the courts come into play in a number of different ways. One, as you make a filing with a court, you're going to be bound not only by that court rule, but you're going to be bound by the rules of professional responsibility in that jurisdiction. And that comes through the McDade Amendment, which says, in essence, that Department of Justice lawyers, federal lawyers, have to abide by the rules of professional responsibility in the jurisdiction in which they're practicing. Now, there's a kick out to that rule which says, unless it's authorized by law or court order, and we can get into that a little bit later because that's 
a fairly sliding scale and somewhat amorphous and depends on which court you're in as to what that's going to mean. But courts have the ability to basically enforce the rules that apply both in the court professional responsibility rules through the contempt power. And if a lawyer gets too far off the reservation, the court can impose some sort of punishment through a contempt citation. There's also at the extreme end, criminal prosecutions. Now this would in all likelihood for federal prosecutors also involve public integrity because public integrity can and has prosecuted prosecutors. It's for things like bribery. It's for things like um, any number of things, uh, bribery, stealing. It can be almost any kind of federal offense, even drug dealing, they've done this in, in a number of instances. So those are the places you would go and you would take that to the court as a normal, regular federal prosecution. The court would ultimately, depending on the verdict or a plea, um, impose sentence. Then you've got congressional oversight. This is, in essence, what an IG's office can do and can trigger because the IG's office will be filing their reports and they'll be filing them with Congress as well as with the public. Congress uses these to have oversight over federal agencies. Congress uses these to decide if the laws need to be changed or amended to fill gaps that may be recognized through the IG's work. And there's, in the oversight function, there is certainly um, a lot of public rebuke that takes place through congressional hearings focusing on misbehavior of prosecutors. Um, a, a classic example is the prosecution of Ted Stevens, where there were Brady violations that had been noted. And there were lots of hearings on that and, and a lot of rebuking of the individual prosecutors that a number of them were disciplined. Um, so that's another function you have. And then you've got the state bars which come in, who, and, and they, depending on the referral that comes, it could be a referral from an opposing counsel, it could be a referral from just a lawyer in the community, it could be a referral from OPR, but the state bar has the power to discipline lawyers, either levy a fine, suspend the lawyer, disbar the lawyer, reprimand the lawyer publicly, anything like that. And then the last one, which is almost never used, is what's called the Hyde Amendment. And this was a provision that was added to the law a number of years ago, which allows a defendant, after they've been acquitted, to um, go to the, um, the court and seek damages, seek to recover the costs of defending a prosecution if they find that the prosecution was vexatious, was done in bad faith, or was frivolous. So this is roughly the panoply of tools that there are in the department to try and regulate lawyers in the conduct of their work as prosecutors for the department. So I should say a couple of things. One is uh, when you talked about public integrity, not only were you the deputy attorney general, but years and years and years before you were in the public integrity section. That's correct. And was, you were there with uh, this guy Holder, there with this guy Holder, there were there were a Steve number Brian of Garten. there were a number of us in the uh, in the grand old days of the public integrity section. Still a fine section in the department, and still an elite group of lawyers. And you know, I'm, I must say, when you lay out all of that, it sounds like nothing could go wrong. I mean, there are so many entities that have uh, overlapping jurisdiction that can ensure that. Uh, if something is wrong, um, it can be taken care of and it can be done so expeditiously. I want to propose a hypothetical to you. Um, I've told you that I was going to do this. In fact, I laid out a little bit of it to you earlier last week, uh, but of course you don't know it in its entirety. Um, and um, I should say to those listening, um, I think it's fair to say that Jim would disagree with some of the points made in the hypothetical. He wouldn't accept those as what is likely to occur. Um, but I have gotten him finally to agree not to fight the hypothetical, to accept it for purposes of this um, conversation. So let me read the hypothetical to you. A senior prosecutor drafts an eavesdropping warrant 
largely based upon a single informant's information. The credibility of the informant is therefore a factor to be considered in determining whether or not the court is to issue the warrant. What is noted in the warrant is that the informant has admitted to criminal activity involving theft. What is not included is that the informant had in fact been caught stealing from the target of the warrant, had been fired, and the matter was referred to law enforcement by the target. To save himself, the informant disclosed to law, inform, uh, law enforcement unrelated criminal activity by the target, which involves connections with organized crime elements and a soon to occur likely murder of an individual whose identity is unknown to the informant. A junior prosecutor on the team believes that the relationship information that is between the target and the informant is relative, relevant to the judge's determination of the informant's credibility and should be disclosed in the application. The senior attorney argues that it's sufficient to have noted the previous criminal activity and that adding any more information, particularly about the relationship, would clearly disclose the identity of the informant. It would make it very obvious who it was. The junior prosecutor concerned that he will be implicated in what he considers wrongdoing goes to their boss. And their boss agrees with the senior prosecutor. First, Jim, does the junior prosecutor have an independent obligation to the court receiving the application? I think he probably does because he's in the process of preparing it. His name is, of course, not going to be on the affidavit or the application. His he name will have just, He will have just worked on the case. Well, I still think that under the rules of professional responsibility, he should be in a position to be responsible for doing what he can to make sure that the rules are complied with when he's part of the, part of the team and working on the matter, whether he's signing it or not. Now, signing it, not signing it, may relieve him of some of the contempt aspects because he may not have submitted a filing to the court, but but um, I still think as part of the team, he knows this is happening. He should take steps to make sure that it's being done properly because it is part of his work as a prosecutor. Well, I mean, he did go to his superior above the senior prosecutor who was managing that group. That individual looked at it, made the determination that the information was not um, critical and that um, given the fact that it would identify the informant once known and it was an organized crime case, um, that information did not have to go in. The mere fact, uh, uh, not everything about an informant is disclosed in, in an application. And the fact that they, the, um, what was disclosed was he had been involved and admitted to criminal activity um, is enough under those circumstances. See, here's where I don't necessarily agree with you. No, number one, you have two things that are operating here from the circumstance that you've identified. One is the prior criminal activity in and of itself. The other is the um, animus that he may have for the object of the warrant because the object of the warrant is the person who caught him stealing, who reported him, who caused the legal problem that he had and therefore could well be a focus of revenge, whether it's accurate or inaccurate revenge, is something that may need to be corroborated and, and determined through corroborating evidence. It's a point that I believe any magistrate would want to know that the informant has a grudge against the, the person with whom he's focusing the information on and is going to be the object of the war. It would seem to me at a minimum that the junior lawyer should be going to pray on. And if he has a concern, and seeking the advice from Preo as to what's the appropriate way to go. If Preo says everything's fine, I think the junior lawyer can rely on that because this is the mechanism set up by the department. There are people there with expertise who can give that advice. 
If, however, Preo says, no, this is a problem, then he brings that to the attention of his superiors within the department, and they make certain determinations. There's, there's any number of ways that might be found to protect the identity of the informant, to protect the information given to the court by filing it under seal separately from the normal law. Uh, well, remember, as you agreed, you're not fighting the hypothetical. So let's right. move on. It's one or the other. It's A or B for our purposes. Um, and so you have the situation. In your experience with Preo, I mean, if Preo is involved purely with ethics, will they always come down on the side of ethics or are they going to look at the need, for example, in this particular case, to protect the identity of the informant and to determine who the murder victim is, is going to be? Well, I think that the Preo is going to do what any other lawyer does. They will look at all of the facts and circumstances and what the legal requirements are that cover it. And Preo is going to tell you if you have a legal requirement, you have a legal requirement and you need to fulfill it. And if you can't fulfill it the way you want to, Preo will work with you to try and find a way to fulfill it and achieve all of the aims and goals you're trying to achieve. I'm not really trying to fight the hypothetical as much as saying there may be other ways to accomplish what you want to accomplish uh, while still making uh, an ethical choice as determined by the ethical experts. All right, well, let's assume that um, the affidavit is submitted. Uh, it's submitted without the additional information. Uh, in fact, it results in the interception of the number of conversations which both lead to the identity of and the protection of the person who's going to be killed and the uh, incriminating evidence against um, both the target and several co-conspirators who are organized crime related. Um, if the identity of the informant and hence the missing information becomes known to the defense attorney, what should be the next steps? Well, I would imagine that the defense attorney is going to do probably two things. One, the defense attorney is going to file a motion in court to suppress the wiretap evidence based on um, material misrepresentations and, and material withhold, withholding of material facts in the application itself or in the affidavit. Secondly, the defense attorney is gonna make a complaint to OPR at the Department of Justice saying that the prosecutors who were involved in the matter, and I would imagine it'll be all of them, that the defense attorney would name all that he or she knows of, violated their ethical rules by not being candid with the court by withholding material information from the, the affidavit or the application. I think those are gonna be the two main ways that that happens. They may also file a complaint with public integrity at that point saying this is a crime because they lied to the court. Uh, but my sense is, is that public integrity would let OPR take an initial look at the, um, at the requirements that were there, the legal requirements before it would start doing a heavy investigation. Let me switch you now from your role as Deputy AG to talking about this to, uh, to uh, defense attorney. Um, let me ask you two questions about that. One, let's pick up on what you said before on filing the complaint with OPR that would be a natural consequence of this. Is that true? I mean, to what extent is a defense attorney having won, let's say, the motion to suppress? Um, going to take the case to OPR and try to sanction the attorneys. And doesn't that if defense attorney then have a difficult time in every case thereafter with the department? Well, no, not necessarily, number one. Number two, I don't think you're gonna see a situation where the defense attorney files a motion to, to suppress, wins it, and then goes to OPR. Many times they'll do it simultaneously so they can go to the court and say, I have also filed this with OPR. That's how serious this is. Um, I don't think that there's going to be necessarily a, an animosity, particularly if, if the case, if the motion to suppress 
is one, then you almost have a priori evidence that ethical violations were made because information was withheld from the warrant that was material to the court. The court has found that. So actually going after that is even is in some cases not unusual. Well, that can't actually be the case. I mean, there have got to be situations where um, warrants are suppressed where there is a question as to whether or not something should have been included or not included. The court comes down one way or the other. Not every time there's a mistake is there a ethical violation of withholding something from the court. No, not every time that there is a mistake, but the question is whether or not you view it under the facts and circumstances as a mistake or something that was intentional. And I've seen many defense attorneys who become very aggressive in this regard and say, look, I'm, I'm going to come after you. If you leave something out in a case I'm in, I'm going to come after you. You should know that. I'm going to try and, and convince prosecutors that they need to look over their shoulder when they're preparing these warrants so that they are careful in what they present to the court and that if they're not careful, they know I'm going to come after them. This is a conditioning exercise as much as it is a legal or an ethical exercise that is not uncommon for defense attorneys to engage in. Right. It also may be that the defense attorneys, after having done this sometimes, find that they don't get any breaks. And I suppose that they uh, find that everything they had to do has to be in writing and there can't be any oral agreements because they're not trusted by prosecutors. It depends on who the prosecutor is. If these are main justice prosecutors and they're more concerned with dealing with AUSAs, that sometimes won't work any harm to them because there can be some competition, shall we say, between main justice prosecutors and AUSAs. Um, let me put you in the role of a defense attorney again, only somewhat differently this time. You have the affidavit that you've received. Um, there's no indication who the informant is. You, through a fluke, just happen to be in the office with somebody else who knew about the previous incident and put two to two together, decided that you actually figured out who the informant was or you were having a conversation with an AUSA and they slipped, or something occurred where you knew, but your clients did not. You also know that your clients uh, don't take kindly to informants, particularly those who give up information which results in them going to prison for a substantial period of time, or may. You have an actual concern that they will do something to the informant. Do you share your belief on who the informant is with your client? Uh, I'm not sure you do. I think that's a little bit outside of what our topic is, but I'm not sure that I do share. Actually, I, I, when I made a note of that, I put it in brackets because I didn't know whether I was going to ask it, but I decided you sitting there and looking incredibly competent, I figured I would throw it at you because the people who are listening might want to know the answer. I think that you've got a very, very thorny situation on your hands and that you may want to try and go seek some legal advice as to your responsibilities. The question is going to be whether it is um, material for your client to know this information. You may be in a position at that point where you may have to withdraw from the representation. Because if you have a fairly firm belief that by sharing this information with your client, you may cause the death of somebody, I think you probably, and I'd have to start looking into a much deeper version of what the rules of professional responsibility are and where they're going to go. But my sense is, is that if you believe you're going to cause harm to somebody, physical harm, including death, that you probably should not disclose the information, but you may not be able to continue the representation. Um, let's say in this case, the defense attorney, save that little piece and let people chew on it. Uh, incidentally, if anybody has uh, questions that they'd like me to put to Jim at some point, uh, as we uh, continue and finish up the hypothetical, uh, please put them on the question and answer function. Um, I will take a look at them and put some to him and then maybe combine some uh, and try to leave 10 or 15 minutes at the end 
uh, for that purpose. Um, let's assume that the defense attorney goes all out on this case and uh, refers the matter to Bar Association. What is its obligation? Well, the Bar Association takes a look at the complaint, determines whether on its face there is made out a violation of the state's rules of professional responsibility. Most states have a requirement that says a, a lawyer who is a member of their bar must report known violations of the rules. Now the word known becomes the important equivocation point in these, but there is in most states a requirement for a lawyer to report known violations. The state bar then is going to take a look at whether or not there is, in their view, sufficient evidence that can be had and sufficient detail in the complaint that it could actually undertake an investigation. Um, why not refer, why not have the state bar refer the matter to OPR that's expert in that area? Well, because the state bar has its own expertise in the area, all OPR can do is determine really subordinate to the state bar, whether they believe a state bar violation occurred. That's largely what OPR's function is, other than whether or not they violated Department of Justice policy, which isn't really subject to the state bar's findings and jurisdiction. So you have two separate issues here. One is the ethical rules of the state, which the state bar enforces. The other are the policies and procedures of the Department of Justice, which OPR enforces. Um, and PREO? PREO gives advice. Well, but are they looking at the policies and procedures of the department, or are they looking at the particular states? Does it then determine, they have to determine in what states the people who've asked for um, yeah. uh, the, the question practice and then study those states' rules and opinions and then issue guidelines? Yes, that's exactly what PREO does, is they will give advice based both on Department of Justice policies and procedures and the applicable state bar regulations that are in So if the, if the senior for example, I'm gonna come back to this in a little bit, but if the senior prosecutor was admitted in one state which authorized this and the junior prosecutor uh, was admitted in the state that did not, what does PREO do? PREO tells them that, tells them that this is, this is PREO's not gonna make the choice. PREO is going to give you the advice of what the state bar rules and the department policies and procedures are. And sometimes they may suggest the best course of action. But ultimately, like with any lawyer, the ultimate decision is going to be made by that lawyer as to how they're going to proceed. Once you have advice from PREO, if they tell you, no, doing this will violate the state bar rules, then obviously, the ability for the state bar to make out an intentional violation of their rules has been enhanced. On the other hand, if PREO says, no, this is not a violation, it may well be a defense. So um, would it make any difference to the state bar if instead of the defense attorney referring the matter, it was the judge who believed that she did not receive all of the information she should have in order to make a appropriate determination on the credibility of the informant. Yeah, I, I think generally, as a practical matter, not as an official matter or a rule-based matter, but as a practical matter, referrals from judges are taken more seriously because they are less frequent in the first place and sometimes less born out of um, animosity that builds up in the course of litigation, which sometimes causes complaints to be made, which may not be well-founded or may be exaggerated. When it comes in from a judge, usually state bars and even truth be known, OPR, probably take it a little more seriously because they think there is probably less to it or, or, or less chance that there is some sort of other personality conflict being involved doesn't mean that when judges make a complaint, there isn't ever a personality conflict involved. There well can be. 
right, when let's, judges take the complaints, it's taken seriously. Let's move on with the hypothetical. Let's assume that the prosecutor relies on a Department of Justice memo that's issued by the Attorney General that says that in any organized crime related case, it is the policy of the department to protect the identity of the, the witness and the informant, even if it interferes with the attorney's other obligations. And let's assume that that has raised um, a lot of questions. And so it was referred to OLC, the Office of Legal Counsel, and they issued an opinion stating that the protection of life is paramount and supersedes virtually all other considerations. Okay. At that point, the American Bar Association um, conducts an analysis of that opinion and finds the reasoning not only flawed, but they believe that there were, the opinion itself omitted a series of obvious legal authorities to the contrary. Those findings have been made public. Does any individual or entity do anything about that? I think you've got, you've got maybe 30 or 40 different issues wrapped up in that part of the hypothetical. And you have, we have about uh, 20 minutes until we, 18 minutes until we take questions. Okay, first of all, um, I think one of, the, one of the things you really need to look at is what does this mean? What do these provisions that are given mean? Because if the protection of the informant is paramount, to all other considerations. Does that mean that the protection of the informant is paramount over the murder of the person that the uh, subject of the eavesdropping warrant is going to be subjected to? So because it's the informant, their life is more valuable than the proposed victim of the murder. I don't think that's the case. And then you're in a real bind. The second part, which is the OLC opinion, which says life is more important than anything else, including other considerations, um, you're in the same bind. Whose life? The informant's life is more important or the victim's, the potential victim's life is more important. You're, you got a lot of problems here with policies like this, and it doesn't mean that the department hasn't put some out in the past because they do, but the policies have so many ambiguous results that can come from them that they may not provide much guidance. Well, we're, we're talking about the rule of law, and so I am- uh, And I don't think I a policy- I'm purposely of, giving you a question which right. uh, invokes that question. But I don't think a policy of the department, number one, we'll start with that, can supersede legal responsibilities. Even if the department says, you take care of that, regardless of other considerations, you still have to abide by the law, you still have to abide by your ethical obligations, and no policy of the Department of Justice can trump those, because they are duly passed either by the courts in which you are operating in and practicing in or by the laws of the United States enacted and put into law and signed by the President of the United States and the department cannot negate those laws through policy. The OLC opinion is a little bit different because generally opinions by the Office of Legal Counsel at the Department of Justice are viewed as binding on the executive branch of the United States government. But it doesn't necessarily supersede or negate other laws that are out there. And to get to the last part of your hypothetical, somebody finds out that there was contrary authority, it was known to the people at OLC when they wrote the opinion and they were instructed to negate it and to ignore it. Oh, I didn't say they were instructed to, yeah. Okay, but that they didn't take it into account. Right. At minimum. Uh, at that point, it, the reasoning behind the OLC opinion, and, and you don't necessarily go behind it, but a court could in trying to analyze it and saying whether or not um, there is an ethical violation, whether or not there is a criminal violation, can say 
this OLC opinion is invalid in my view. Number one, I'm the judicial branch. So I'm outside of the executive. I'm not bound by an OLC opinion. Number two, you may have professional misconduct on the part of the OLC lawyers by um, not taking into account and not doing thorough work. This is, but some of that will depend on whether this was done intentionally or not. This is the John Yu case from a long time ago, writing the torture memos, where OPR found that John Yu uh, ignored a lot of the contrary authority in coming to his conclusions, recommended discipline, and the chief career officer at the Department of Justice overrode OPR saying, John Yu basically did a very bad job of lawyering, but he didn't do it intentionally and therefore shouldn't be disciplined. But I think the problem you've got here is that you are supposed to do a very thorough job as a lawyer. If you don't, if you're just a bad lawyer, I don't think that necessarily violates the rules of professional responsibility. Well, let's go back to McDade. And, and um, all of a sudden now, the Bar Association is looking at this case and saying, do we discipline this individual? And the individual comes forward and says, look, I, I was following department policy. And the McDade Amendment says that if I was doing something under the authority of law or rules, then I am outside um, your jurisdiction. That's not quite what the McDade, McDade Amendment says. It says if you are following the law or a, or a court order, it doesn't say rules. And the question though is how courts have interpreted the law, which is many times in a number of the cases that you see, equivalent to kind of the customary way that investigations have been carried on and courts have not stopped it or found it to be illegal or have tacitly condoned it through cases that have been in front of them. And then the court says, so therefore it must be legal. So therefore it's outside of the coverage of the McDade Amendment, which gets to be pretty dicey because that's going to be very dependent on which court you're in. And you've seen cases that go all over the place in that regard. But again, unless you are, this is where the intentionality may come in. Just being a bad lawyer uh, may subject you to discipline in the department for being a bad lawyer. They may decide to fire you because you're not a good lawyer, but it may not subject you to discipline from, from the bar or firing for, some, for misconduct purposes. Let's, let's take it one step further. Um, Congress has received an allegation that the newly politically appointed head of OLC uh, personally instructed his subordinates working on the memo to reject any contrary authority as irrelevant. Um, what are Congress's options at that point? Well, I think number one, Congress does a couple of things. One, they're going to open up oversight hearings on this as to what happened in this memo. They're going to demand documents. They are going to call witnesses to see what happened. Number two, they're probably going to refer it back to the Department of Justice, to either the IG or to the Office of Professional Responsibility. The Office of Professional Responsibility is probably the right place for it to go. They'll also refer it uh, to the Public Integrity Section because there is certainly the chance that if that was the case, that what has happened is the head of OLC has committed a crime by submitting a false statement to an agency of the United States making the statement that this is in fact the law when he knows it is not in fact the law. And there could be a, potentially a criminal prosecution for that. So it's going to be a play that's going to get staged in many, many theaters at this point. Well, the play reaches its denouement when the head of OLC says that, look, I I did it, but I did it because I was advised directly by the Attorney General to do so. This was critically important to him. Um, he wanted this opinion. Uh, I gave him what he wanted. Then you've just act, you've added 
another actor to the play and you put the attorney general's um, own conduct very much at issue, you then may have the Judiciary Committee of the House looking at it from an impeachment standpoint. Because again, you are, you are having an attorney general under this factual scenario, presumably making a statement of, I don't care what the law is, this is the result, ignore any contrary authority, give me this opinion, period, even though it's not the law. Um, that is aiding and abetting, if not being a, a principal in making a false statement to a government agency, even if it's the attorney general's own government agency. Well, let's take this sort of crazy scenario where even if the House were to impeach, the Senate would not convict. So the attorney general is essentially free and clear. The department is not going to do anything about it. Um, but it does get referred to the Bar Association. Right. Now the Bar Association has a complaint made by, I don't know, law professors, by the department, uh, by uh, Congress, um, by anybody who takes an interest in this, by the American Bar Association, that the Attorney General of the United States has engaged in unethical conduct. I think what, does the, what does the Bar Association do? Well, first of all, the Bar Association could take it up on their own, just seeing it in the newspaper, which will be, I'm sure, prominent. And this is very much what happened to Bill Clinton. He was impeached. He was not convicted. And he lost his license because he lied in a deposition. And the Arkansas Bar took his license away. I don't recall right now whether it was a suspension or a disbarment or a disbarment with a chance to reinstate, but he lost his license for a number of years as a result of this. This is the same kind of thing. And there is also still the possibility of prosecution of the Attorney General, although the prosecutors would have to come from the federal prosecutorial ranks. So the question is whether or not under department policy and under regs, you would have to appoint a special counsel to come in and deal with the case, um, all of which would be possible at that point, and I would imagine Congress would be screaming for it. But you've got a number of different places where things could happen. Impeachment, prosecution, as well as, um, as, as bar discipline. Um, so we've dealt uh, in the few minutes we have left. And again, if anybody has any questions, please submit them um, now using the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. I'll be able to see it and I'll be able to um, ask Jim about it. Um, we dealt almost exclusively with the Department of Justice, but there are other departments and agencies which have attorneys. Um, some of which opine on criminal and regulatory matters. Um, those entities have inspectors general who are tasked with disclosing illegal or unethical conduct. Um, how free are they um, to undertake their responsibilities? And I'll ask you this in a more difficult way. How free are they in theory and how free are they in practice? Well, in theory, they are supposed to be independent. They're supposed to operate within the agencies, but have independence from the agency so that they can perform their duties and speak truth to power, to use a phrase. The chief mechanism to do this, aside from the statements that are made in the various IG acts that set it up and the the use of SIGI, which is the organization that where all the IGs belong and has some um, advisory powers, is through the reporting that IGs do to Congress. They have a very important dual role of telling Congress what it is they find in the course of their work and making full reports to Congress on the results of their investigations. And if they are improperly removed, if their investigations are improperly impeded, um, if the departments that they investigate 
don't take into account and try to remedy the faults that the IG's offices identify and document, Congress is probably the main focal point to try and enforce the independence of the IG and enforce that uh, remedial requirement that the IG is putting forward. But Congress, as we know, is limited in what it can do. It can hold oversight hearings. It can shine the light of exposure and publicity on the activity and yell and scream about it. And it can try to pass legislation to remedy it if they can do that. But I think as we've seen in the past number of years, Congress has a more and more difficult time passing legislation and the heated atmosphere which is taking place in Congress kind of takes a legitimate complaint that they may have about the activity at an agency and drown it in the other noise because there's so much fighting that goes on between the different parties in Congress at this point that it is a constant fight. And there is no fight that seems to stand out anymore. So I think the effectiveness of congressional oversight is starting to really wane just because of the constant battle that's going on in Congress. So question has come in asking what we do when an IG has been fired. Um, so under the statute, uh, the president can fire an IG that is uh, nominated by the, uh, the president and confirmed by the Senate, but has to give a reason to the Congress why it was done. Right, and then you're back to Congress to say, to hold a hearing and say whether or not they think that reason is adequate, whether or not that firing was justified. And ultimately, the last bastion of power for Congress would be to change the inspector general law and remove the power of firing or condition the power of firing on the agreement of Congress or the agreement of some other body. Who knows what, that sh what shape that might take. But without the change of law, Congress can yell and scream, and maybe rightly so, but it may not change much. The power to fire right now, as you point out, is held by the president in most instances and can be exercised really without much, uh, much restriction other than the requirement that the president explain why. And the explanation can be, I've lost confidence in that person. The explanation could theoretically be because I felt like it. Yeah. There is no requirement that the explanation meet a certain standard. Um, so at the beginning, we said that one of the things we were going to explore are whether or not these mechanisms that are put into place that we've discussed in um, uh, sort of enormous detail uh, work and if they don't, uh, what can be done about it? Um, and so when it comes to inspectors general uh, who are fired at the whim of a president uh, uh, on his own or on the behest of the secretary of the department in which the inspector general serves, um, you suggest that maybe in another world we could strengthen the laws regarding uh, the permanency of an inspector general, uh, either for a particular term of years or um, during good behavior. Um, but what about the others? Can we require, for example, I mean, you pointed out the Clinton situation. Uh, there have been allegations made against other attorneys general, um, uh, often with, uh, I think, uh, a fairly a serious degree of force behind them, and no action's been taken. Um, by its very nature, uh, what the state bar associations do is confidential. No one knows about it. No one can find out about it. Is that a serious issue? I mean, I, I know that when somebody commingles accounts or takes money from an escrow account, there are serious consequences. When the um, alleged um, problem is less direct, uh, very rarely do I see anything occurring. Uh, is that something that we can change, modify, um, require transparency? 
I, I think the problem that you run into with this is that these are not bright line tests and they're usually not bright line issues. Something like commingling money or stealing from a client escrow account, it's pretty cut and dry. It's pretty provable. So many of the other aspects of bar discipline um, are not nearly as capable of kind of black and white positive versus negative proof. And there are many complaints that come into bars that are not well founded and may be the product of some animosity or maybe the product of ignorance about what the rules really stand for. And I guess the question is how, how open do we want this system to be? Because do we want any complaint that comes into the bar to be a public complaint and therefore you can immediately smear your opponent in a case by making a complaint that may be enough to get you over a bar of uh, it was a well-founded complaint, but it's only meant to harass and to smear your opponent in some big trial. Well, of course, that, that occurs anyway, right? When somebody publicly says, uh, this was outrageous conduct and I have referred it to the local bar association and yes. I have received a response from them. Yes, but, some, but if the local bar association puts it out, it takes on a very different quality. Then it all of a sudden has their imprimatur of this is serious enough for us to be looking at and it elevates it from what may be a spat between two lawyers into something that's worthy of the bar actually taking action to determine if it's true or not and what should be done. So I, I think you've got, you have to weigh all of that. I'm not saying that that should negate in, in any blanket way what the bar does, but there are some valid considerations of privacy that need to be thought about and weighed in how public you're going to make the process of the state bars. Secondly, I, I think that the state bars ought to be enforcing their rules a little more vigorously and a little more promptly. It takes forever for a state bar to do an investigation. They may not have the resources to really put those investigations together. By the time that's happened, the attorney has been practicing for probably years at that point without anything having been said or done. And maybe the lawyer is continuing to commit violations, maybe not, who knows. But I think there needs to be a, a, a more prompt mechanism in the state bars. And I think there needs to be a little more adherence to what the state bar rules are. There's a whole range of state bar sanctions that can be meted out. And those can help you define Find what the seriousness of the violation is. But it seems to me that there needs to be a little bit more teeth in the state bar regulation than there is right now. Should we, should we, should we be relying on state bars or should there be a federal bar um, with federal uh, code of uh, ethics uh, which bind federal attorneys acting in their uh, official capacity and uh, so that it's not dependent upon what 50 different or 51 different jurisdictions believe. Well, it, again, as a practical matter, most of the bar rules that you see are based on the ABA model rules. And if you have a federal bar, their rules are going to be in the main based on the ABA model rules. You're going to have a change here and there. You may have some tweaking on the contacts policy with represented parties, which is many times one of the big issues between federal prosecutors roles and what they do and the and running into state bars. You may also have the issue of candor with different parties involved in the case because undercover operations necessarily require a degree of deception in order to make the undercover operation undercover. There were differences in uh, subpoenaing um, attorneys to the grand jury uh, that may vary from state to state, but also the way states view all of these are different. Um, there is no way of resolving differences among and between the states. 
And so federal prosecutors is the, the situation I described to you earlier, where you had the senior prosecutor in one jurisdiction, the junior one in another, and the rules were different, uh, create a real issue. Why should it be that the states ought to control what federal prosecutors, federal attorneys generally do? And let, let me throw in one last question uh, that came in, and that is if, as opposed to a president, the attorney general is disbarred, um, what happens um, with that attorney general? Has not been impeached, has not been removed, uh, but a local bar has determined if the attorney general was disbarred. All right. Uh, let me take the two questions. And, and we have three minutes and then we're at an end. Okay. Uh, the federal bar is, um, there's pluses and there's minuses to it. it. It may be more uniform, but most federal prosecutors prosecute in a single jurisdiction. They're assistant United States attorneys. They prosecute in their state. Local DAs are subject to those same rules and operate under the same rules. There is a group at Maine Justice that prosecute and operate in many different states, but this then gets into a matter of which state's rules um, rule and control, and frequently it's the state in which you are practicing whose rules will control, and you just need to be aware of them. So I'm not sure it's, I'm not sure it's a huge problem. I can see some benefits. I can also see setting up um, a new bureaucracy which may have its own problems that we don't anticipate right now as we look at it down the road. As to your last question, I think it's an interesting issue because as a matter of law, the Attorney General of the United States doesn't need to be a lawyer. Just needs to be nominated by the President and confirmed by the Senate. Now the Attorney General under the statutes is supposed to over see prosecutions and the, the work of the department, but there's no requirement to sign pleadings. There's no requirement to actually practice law. So I think there's a little bit of tension in that provision in defining the attorney general's job. But as a general matter, as long as the attorney general didn't appear in court and didn't sign pleadings, the attorney general, even though disbarred, could probably still function as the attorney general until impeached. Can a, an, can a lawyer take instructions from a non-lawyer? They do it all the time. They do it from their clients. Well, in some cases they do, in some cases they don't, but, but, but certainly in terms of the client can't tell the lawyer what to put in a memo. No, the client can't tell a lawyer what to put in a memo. But, but the attorney general can say, this is the position I want the department to take. Right. But then you're also dealing with two separate things. One is, is it a legal position or is it a policy position? And certainly there's a difference in much of what the, process, the, the Department of Justice does, particularly at the attorney general level, is decide issues of policy. There's not a lot of deciding issues of law as much as there is issues of policy. What kinds of cases are we going to bring? What kinds of points do we want to make through our prosecutions? Where are we going to focus our efforts so that people understand this is an area of concentration for the department uh, and will respond accordingly? Most of those things are policy, and, and that can be done by a layperson. And it is now 4.00, so we are ending precisely on time. Perfect. Thanks, Ron, for a very interesting afternoon. Thank you. And thank all of those who watched and sent in questions. Thank you all.